actually patchouli was uh, rebranded, uh, so Shaili was patchouli. Yeah. One question. Yes. Just briefly, uh, you are working with different countries all over the world, and you are in a privileged position to, to see. Uh, do you see different patterns in the different countries or geographic areas, or are they moving together? I think they are moving together, and because it's it's very difficult with the the, the graph I, I display with the sensors, it's uh, it's very general. So um, there's something to consider that uh, we have a lot of scenarios identified, but every day we are seeing more and more scenarios. So in the past months, we have done a project for measuring the stress levels in koalas. Yeah, which is because being a koala is very stressful, especially those days. <laughs> and other thing we've done is to include our radiation sensors into the Artusat project, which is uh, an open hardware satellite, the first one. And another one is um, a project based on the eHealth sensor platform with a company that uh, actually makes uh, consumer products. So they are using one of our sensors for detecting pneumonia in babies in Africa. So, and every day we, have, we are seeing and identifying more and more. So I would say that uh, after reviewing that, smart cities and agriculture is something kind of general, globally. What sensor do you use with the products? The accelerometer. <laughs> How does that measure stress in the koala? <laughs> if they sleep the whole day, they're not stressed. That's what you thought. <laughs> no, it's it's true that they, they they are night animals and they wake up and they start to behave like uh, something like that. So they are trying to to see that. I have a question about air quality. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I live. China for seven years, and so something that we all do in China is everyone, especially in the big cities, you have an app on your phone uh, that tells you the PM 2.5 index for that day. That's the you know the, the small particles that you get into your lungs. And you, you were talking about smart cities and how it's, it's a nightmare because of course you have to deal with politicians, you have to deal with regulation, you have to deal with blah 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 blah. Why? Why not focus more on the, the individual, especially in my my experience. Uh, Asians, uh, Asian countries tend to be very comfortable with using technology in their everyday lives, especially these kind of things like sensors, where they quite honestly don't trust the, the, the public data that's available. They, they <coughs> want to get it themselves, and they will only trust their own, their own data. First of all, so my question is, first, do you have any PM 2.5 uh, sensors, and, and are you thinking about moving into Asia specifically? With these kind of tech. We have PM10 sensors, which is not that accurate. And it's very easy to integrate the other one, the 2.5. And the only, the only reason why we are not doing yet, it's because it's uh, uh, significantly more expensive. So we are doing that on demand. Um, Regarding citizens, that was that was the reason why Fukushima thing was so successful in terms of crowdsourcing and sharing the data. And that was because in a crisis situation, you never trust the establishment. Because maybe the government don't want you to panic because they don't they can't evacuate all of you. So that's what people is, uh, are thinking. So, uh, in, many, in, in many smart cities conferences, there's one thing that um, I'm especially pushing, uh, one idea. When it comes to, to funding, there's uh, always just two uh, options. The first one is public funding, the second one is uh, private funding, and return over the years by offering a service. And I'm, I'm always telling about the Fukushima example and saying, why not offering tax breaks to those activist citizens that are willing to, 
to offer their balconies and their money to buy one small sensor. I think that could be um, that could be an answer. And I've been testing this idea in many conferences. In the first one, people were saying that I was just crazy. Now, maybe I, I, I'm getting some faces of, could be, which is kind of a success, so let's see. Yes, we have designed um, with our product. It's called Wasmode, and it's uh, it could be a, a, a physical image for you. It could be Arduino, which is a physical board. Do you, do you know what Arduino is, right? Okay, so it's a different kind of Arduino, could be said. And we are always doing the the value we are adding is the. Um, the, all the hardware needed to integrate different communication protocols. We are not the, uh, the communication modules manufacturers. We are integrating them, nor even the sensors. And what we made with the WASM mode is to make all those things work with the lowest power. We have uh, in the hibernate state, WASM mode is consuming not point not seven microamps, so it can last for a long time. And we are offering a, a high level API to deal with all, uh, all the, the modules. And we are also growing and maintaining a more than 2,000 developers community in our, in our website, with, uh, where developers are contributing to the, um, to the improvement of the platform. In fact, the, in last year, in September, when we launched Plug and Sense, which is the, the second generation of, of WASMOD, um, many of the improvements were, uh, were introduced by the community. So basically we are enables, and we work with system integrators and with third party companies that are delivering the solutions to the end users. In Cooking Hacks, we are offering the products directly to the, to the consumers. To the hackers. Meant that 
we can now actually, for the first time ever, do a public demo of the Faceware IoT system, which is pretty cool. It's been shown around to people. People that bought the kit will have this, this, this demo, but this is probably the first time that we will, uh, uh, that we have it up and running in a more public uh, venue. So that's cool. Okay, so I am, my name is Adam Nuggles. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Faceware. I am also, I can start asking how many here know about the Contiki operating system. Two or three people. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, the operating system is a it's an open source firmware that you can put on a connected chip like the MSP430 or the ADR or any number of ARM chips and uh, been developed for, for the past 10 years. It's going to be pretty much the sole barrier, barrier, carrier idea of, of being able to connect things to the internet. And 10 years ago, that was that was pretty, you know, the internet hadn't evolved as much as it's done now. Now the internet has, has really pushed the limits. We have internet pretty much everywhere. Well, you know, maybe not 3G everywhere, and well, maybe not Wi-Fi everywhere either. Yeah, it's pretty much everywhere. But if you go out of the streets, it's not going to do Wi-Fi all over the place. So if you want to do the smart streets, uh, smart city applications up that, up that we saw that that Lionelium showed, it's going to be a tough thing to do with Wi-Fi. Well, if you put a, a SIM card like the uh, Telefonica guy said, but you know, you want to have the SIM cards and you want to do the smart street lighting. Uh, stuff and you have SIM cards everywhere and every street light pole. You know, maybe not the, the, the best solution technically to do that. Uh, so there is this realm of uh, systems that's been uh, covered by, by things like Zigbee and Zenway and Bluetooth Low Energy and various types of uh, uh, custom radio protocols that, that people have been using. We wanted to do with, with ThingSquare was to extend the internet, taking the next step into this realm of of, of low power wireless uh, protocols and systems. And we take that, that smart city application and, and put those street lights onto the internet, onto an IP network so that you can build an application in a matter of days, not having to learn everything that has to do with super specialized radio protocols to do this. And uh, now we do have a, a system for doing that. Now let me see if I can get this up and running. Yes, I do. So what I have here. I could just speak up. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So what I have here, I'm going to disconnect this for a while, is that it's really just a, a one chip thing sitting right here. Uh, it, this is a, a Texas Instruments system on a chip. It's a combined radio and a microprocessor that you can put in your your, your product. If you want to build a, a smart street light, you you just put this chip in there, and you got the radio and the microprocessor. What we have done is put IP version six on this, so that you can connect using a wireless mesh network that is automatically built from all these chips that you put out there and connect to either your behind firewall like network or even to the global internet. And all you need is pretty much another chip that sits somewhere with an ethernet chip on it and you can keep, uh, bridge that over. You don't need to have a special super smart uh, how to do that or proc currency or translator gateway. Just put that up and, and it will work. So the board here, uh, thank you, is uh, we have just a display and some sensors on top of that. And uh, when I power this up, it connects to, I have another uh, board sitting over there that's connected to my laptop that bridges this to the internet, but I broke the ethernet cable. So I think that's probably come off because I, I don't see this probably up onto the, uh, it's not connected to, to the server. Okay, I sold the internet. <laughs> I can show it down right away because it just stuff like phone okay. that's connected. So let's see if we can get to the, Yes, probably, probably, uh, probably will be the 
Magic. Oh, it actually just popped up a line, so it did work. The cable had broken, right? With some disconnected. It is, yeah, it just connected. I just saw that. Okay, so that was a great demo of how all persistent our system is. Just plug it in. So, uh, you can see the, what you're seeing here is, is really the sensor itself the board. X, Y, Z, accelerators, you've got a light sensor, so if I pull my finger up over it, or go down, I see some other values in there, and yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but what this really is, is if you want to build your own uh, connected screen, on the <laughs> you want to do things like light in the system. You've got it right here, so we can just see if we can roll this up. Uh, there's an LED here. You can dim the LEDs. You can group them. And then, uh, oh yeah, nice. And there's a green thing over there. Uh, they can do that. And you see them all because now I'm actually controlling all the, this device is connected here. You can link it. You get all the sorts of things. And if you want to build a smart meter, we've got that too. And if you want to do your remote sensing application, well, we got that too. You can look at the history of these. Uh, these uh, light and accelerator readings that we saw, it's just saving the server. So it's really, uh, we try to, to make it really easy to build your connected product uh, from just getting a chip, logging in, taking that chip to production, then you're pretty much set uh, with, with all that we have here. And uh, it's grown out of, a, of an open source project that put the open source firmware on top of these, these chips. So all the stuff on the chips is open source. So you're safe in terms of you know, know what you're running on your device is all open source. The uh, server side software is not open source, but you, you get a license for that, or you can buy a, uh, a subscription uh, as you test your product. And I think you know, that was probably exhausted my four minutes I had. Uh, <laughs> so it worked. It did work. Yes. Okay. It did fail, but it didn't come up to life So uh, yeah, yes, questions. 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 I'm not totally sure that I understand you properly, but I think you said that by, by many of these devices can connect together in, in uh, by, by radios, uh, frequencies, something like that, That's and right. build their own network. Yes. Uh, Therefore, each of these is, uh, is emitting and receiving, and it's totally broadcasting and, and so on. Right. Um, and isn't this uh, not so battery savvy uh, in, in terms of uh, building the sensor network? Right, that's a great question. Yeah, how do you do, do meshing with, with low power mechanisms? So what we do is, is we call it CPU meshing. It's, a, it's basically what we do is waking up very, very briefly, a couple of times per second, and uh, on the order of you know, 200 microseconds every four, four times per second or so. So we wake up very, very briefly and listen if there is something in the air. And if someone is trying to tell us something, we'll notice that by just measuring the, the single strike in the air. And if there is something in the air, we can be awake for a little while longer to see if we can pick up that transmission. And when we do that, we'll send an act to that guy saying that, that I saw it now. So the next time around, that guy will be able to just head out once without you know, just keep sending for the first time, keep sending. Next time, just hit, hit and we'll uh, just Hit this this small time that we are awake, and it works for very well. We're down at 99% off and doing full meshing, so it, it actually works very well. We can combine these things. We can have them all powered completely off as well, and have just a few nodes meshing and and, and mix and match. And it works pretty well. May I just ask, how, which was the biggest uh, sensor network that you have built and, and tested? Well. Yeah, that, that's a great question. We've had, had it running for 100 and something nodes uh, in one mesh. Uh, I think, I don't know the exact number. I know that we had, with, we had one customer trial with up to 100 nodes on one type of radio. We've had a couple of test beds run, runs on uh, more than 100 nodes. Uh, we're running it on, let's see, 
least three or four different types of radios and different frequencies. Uh, we were running it on four or five different CPU platforms, and they're all actually talking together. And uh, so, so we, we try to uh, expand on different dimensions here, but, but uh, so far, I, I think 100 is, uh, slightly over 100 is, is the largest installation as far. And then the last question, if I uh, am allowed. Uh, how these guys know which is the node that's connected to the internet? Or is it just uh, a big broadcast uh, and you hope that they will reach the node uh, connected? Right, that's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. What, what they do is they, they run a protocol called Ripple. It's, uh, it's an IDF standard, actually. Uh, that one node is, is taking the lead, saying, I am the, I am the root of this network, setting the root, the ID number of the network to be his own IPv6 address. And uh, all the other nodes just join this. And what we have added to this is, is if the network suddenly becomes too confused, if, if all the routes just starts to go around and we see the loops and stuff, uh, we have the, the ability for another node to just assume uh, become the new route. Uh, they see that, that the rank of the, the network, that the, the quality metric goes up to infinity that just takes charge and becomes a new route. So it's sort of semi sort of self selected system, uh, but, but it's very well defined what happens when there is a root node. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. More questions? What's the maximum range? What frequencies do you guys use? Right, so the range is, it depends a bit on the type of frequencies that we use. So for, for 2.4 gigahertz, we are not going much further than, than say, Wi-Fi. Uh, for sub gigahertz, we've seen up to kilometer, kilometer range uh, for a single transmission. And it depends a bit on the kind of speed that you need. So if you just pull the speed down, go further, because every bit just becomes much stretched in the air, so it gets 